Welcome back to our guided tour of the creation week. Last video, we looked at day six. And I want to point something out. We didn't get to it in the last video, but we're going to pick up there as we jump into this video about day seven. We're going to jump right in. No housekeeping up front, but stay tuned later in the video for how you can help this channel if you appreciate this ministry and this teaching. something of a pattern that I want to point out in the Genesis days, and it has to do with these yoms. We've talked about in the first video in this series that yom can mean day, it can mean daylight, it can mean daytime, it can mean just a long period of time, or it can mean just a general expression as we would use the word when, W-H-E-N. So instead of saying when something happened in Hebrew, you would say in the day of such and such happening. Well, on the creation yoms, it's pretty interesting because look at how they're numbered. At the end of the first yom, it's yom echad, a first day, literally day and then one echad then we come to the second yom yom sheni day two this is indefinite it's not the day the second day it's just a day second so you would say a second day it's indefinite third day yom shalishi a day three or third indefinite when we get to a fourth day Yom Ravi'i, a fourth day. Day five, Yom Chamishi, a fifth day. So these are all indefinite. A fifth day, a first day, a second day, a third day, a fourth day, a fifth day. And then we come to day six, which we looked at in the last video with the crown of creation, man and woman, Adam, created in the image of God. And look what we see. Yom Hashishi, the sixth day. Not a sixth day, but the sixth day. So on this culminating creative act, now we finally have, and if you don't know Hebrew, this little letter right here, this is the definite article. It's like the English word the. You stick it on the front of a word and it makes it definite. So the word for sixth would just be shishi, but with ha on the front of it, ha shishi, the sixth. So there's a definiteness. Now, I'm not trying to hang any theological baggage on this. I just want to point it out because it's interesting. All of the days leading up and then when humankind is created, that is the sixth day. Like there's a definiteness to it. It breaks the pattern that we've seen so far. So these are the creative acts that God has brought about in Genesis chapter one. And then we talked about in the last video how there's an unfortunate chapter break that somebody decided to call the next section chapter two, verse one, but it's still in the account of chapter one. So first chapter break in the Bible, unfortunate, misplaced. You can safely ignore it. We're still in what I will refer to as the Genesis one account. Now look what we see, chapter two, one. So the sky and the land, or Hashemayim v'ha'ar, it's the heavens and the earth, and all their armies were finished. Now older translations would say all the hosts, maybe like the heavenly hosts, or in all their array or something like that. But this Tzava'am is the word for armies. Yahweh Tzava'oth is Yahweh of armies, the Lord of heavenly hosts. The Lord. So this is referring to the animals, the plants, the fish, the birds, the people, all of it as their armies, their hosts, their regiments. Their uh, regiment's probably too technical, but it is the word for armies. So it's an interesting image of like the great general overlooking all of the forces arrayed before him that he has set in place, alluding to possibly, I don't want to press this too far, but possibly alluding to that fill the earth and subdue it mandate that we had looked at before, where there is uh, hints of a potential future conflict that, that not all, even in a good creation, there's something out there that Adam, as the image of God, is going to need to subdue. And so the heavens and the earth and all their armies are arrayed before the creator. Verse two, God finished his work that he did on the seventh yom. Now, here we have the first instance. Ba yom ha 
Shavii. So this is doubly definite. Yom here is definite. It, if this were not, if it were just a day, this would not say ba yom. This would say b yom on a day. But this says ba yom on the day. And seventh is also like the previous days made definite. Ha shavii, the seventh day. So just like the sixth day now, this is grammatically speaking, at least signaling even more definite. God finished his work that he did on the seventh yom and he rested or he ceased by Yishbot. This is where the word Shabbat comes from. Yishbot is the verbal form of that. He rested, he ceased, he Sabbathed on the seventh day. There it is again, Bayom Hashivii, the seventh yom from all his work that he did. Verse three, so God blessed the seventh yom. And now in this third instance of it, it has the definite direct object marker instead of the definite article, but it's the same concept. This is definite and this is the direct object. This is what was receiving the action of blessing. He blessed eth yom hashivii, the seventh day. So not only do you have the definite direct object marker and the definite article on each of these instances, but you have it repeated three times, tripartite repetition, the seventh day, the seventh day, the seventh day. When something's repeated in scripture, it is for emphasis. When you see something repeated twice in scripture, pay attention. When you see it repeated three times in scripture, that's like a blaring flashing sign. Verse three, so God blessed the seventh yom and made it holy, sanctified it. For on it, he rested, he ceased from all his work that he did in creating. So now on this yom, we see God, the divine craftsman, the heavenly worker who's been going about his heavenly work week, getting up, doing something on the day, then there's evening, then there's morning, which is when you would sleep, then the next day doing something again, there's evening and morning, which was when you sleep, then the next day. So there's six days and then the seventh is rest, intentionally ceasing from doing the work, the occupation that the text presents him as engaging in. So this is how the Genesis 1 creation account ends. It's how it caps it off. And then look what comes right after this in chapter 2, verse 4. This is the hinge. This is the verse that's going to, some would argue, this is the end of the Genesis 1 account, chapter 2, verse 4. Some argue chapter 2, verse 4 is the beginning of the next section in Genesis. There's debate on that. Genesis scholars and interpreters, if you read the commentaries, they don't agree. Should 2-4 be a new paragraph or should it be the end of the previous section? I take a mediating approach. I think it serves as a hinge. It is one of the Toledot sections. What I mean is it says, Ele Toledoth. These are the, and this word Toledoth, it, it's a plural and it comes from the word yalad, which means to bear or to generate or to bring forth, to give birth. These are the, sometimes people say genealogies, sometimes say this is the account of. Um, I just kind of stick with sort of a woodenly literal generations. These are the generations of the sky and the land, Hashamaim v'ha'aretz, or the heavens and the earth. When they were created, is literally in their being created. The yom, there it is right there, b'yom, on a day, and this is indefinite now, on a day of Yahweh God creating the land and the sky, Eretz v'shamayim. So capping it all off, whether this is, again, the end of the first creation account, or if this is the beginning of the second, I think it serves double duty and therefore it's a perfect hinge. These are the generations of the sky and the land or of the heavens and the earth. So we have just seen, how did Genesis 1-1 begin? Remember the video on day one in this series, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, or in the beginning of God's creating the heavens and the earth, or when God began to create. So this is a bookend. 2-4 is an inclusio with 1-1. One, one. In the beginning, God created. What did he create? The heavens and the earth. Now let's unfold this process. This is what it was like when God began to create the heavens and the earth, and the creation week unfolds. And so now at the end, these are the generations of the heavens and the earth, the sky and the land, Hashamayim Baha'aretz, however you want to translate this term. When they were created on the day of Yahweh God 
creating land and sky. So on the day, here we see Yom, there it is, Bayom, on day, all of the creation events, everything, all of these Yoms, these Yamims that we've been looking at in each of these videos, now all of them are denoted with a singular day in the day of God's creating. So again, when people demand that the Genesis days be interpreted literally, because that's what the word Yom means in Hebrew, it's just not true. The word Yom is very flexible in Hebrew. And here is an instance of Yom referring to all of the creation days. And here is an instance in verse five of Yom just referring to daylight. And here is an instance in verse five, same verse of Yom referring to the day and the night together. So regardless of whether you think the Genesis creation account is describing a literal 24 hour day over seven of them, however many thousands of years ago, if you ascribe to a young earth creationist and answers in Genesis, Ken Ham type approach, that's fine. If you're persuaded by that theologically, I don't really care to argue against it and, and kind of say, no, 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 you can't, you can't, you can't. I think scripture allows for that type of reading, I don't think scripture demands that type of reading. In fact, I know for a fact scripture does not demand that type of reading. So you're free to hold it. But what you're not free to do is tell other Christians who don't hold that view that they are deficient, that they are betraying the gospel, they're undermining biblical authority, any of that other stuff. That is when you've moved from having a conviction about your interpretation to just being wrong. The fact of the matter is there are multiple ways to interpret the Genesis yoms, whether you think they're literal solar days or not solar because the sun wasn't even created until day four. So they'd have to be supernatural days. If that's what you think, cool. Whether you think they're heavenly days, like we don't know how time works from God's perspective in heaven versus time on earth. So these days in heaven could be long periods of time on the earth, whether you try to concord them with different geological ages, or whether you take a functional approach and say this whole thing is literarily structured to teach us who and why, not how and when creation came about. Any of those approaches you're free to take. Just be charitable towards people who have different approaches and be willing to listen. And more than anything, scour the text read the text, stay with the text. If the text doesn't say something, hold that with very loose hands. That's the theme of this video series. There are too many people that are too dogmatic about their view of what Genesis 1 teaches, and we just don't need more of that in the world. We need careful readers of scripture who are willing to listen and dialogue and debate and engage and truly be sharpened by one another. Two more things I want to point out about this seventh Yom, Yom Hashivi'i. One, it doesn't end. You don't read, there was evening, there was morning, Yom Hashivi'i. You don't read that, there was a day seven. No, you read three times what God did on the seventh day, which is actually not do anything, intentionally resting, Sabbathing, and then it goes right into the next section of Genesis with this hinge verse. These are the generations of Hashamayim Baha'aretz, the sky and the land, the heavens and the earth, when they were created on the day of God creating the heavens and the earth, the sky and the land. So you have no, there was evening, there was morning, day seven. The seventh day didn't end. And later in scripture, there's going to be talk about entering God's rest, entering into this heavenly Sabbath. So the idea among a number of interpreters going all the way back into ancient times was that the seventh day is still going on. The seventh day was not a literal 24 hour day. And what that likely means is the previous six days should not be read as literal 24 hour days either. Or at the very least to read them that way is not necessarily demanded by the text. Now this word toledot is just worth keeping in mind because the whole rest of Genesis is going to be structured around these Toledot accounts. You're going to have in chapter 2, verse 4, what we see, this is the Toledot, the generations of the heaven and the earth. In 5.1, you're going to get, these are the generations of Adam. 
Then in 6, 9, you're going to get the generation of Noah. Then in chapter 10, the table of nations, you're getting, these are the generations of the sons of Noah, Ham, Shem, and Japheth. And then in chapter 11, it's going to zero in. These are the generations of Shem in the line of Noah. That's going to take us to 1127, where you get, this is the genealogy, or these are the generations of Terach, which is Abraham's dad. Then in 2512, you're going to get a look at the generation, the Toledot of Ishmael. And then in 2519, you're going to get the Toledot of his brother Isaac. In 36, 1 and 9, you're going to get the Toledot, and it's mentioned twice, of Esau. And then in 37, 2, you get the Toledot of his brother, Jacob. And so after Genesis 12, really the whole book of Genesis shifts. All of these Toledot are sort of front-loaded into the early parts of Genesis, Genesis 1 through 11. And then when you get to Genesis 12 and the seed of Terah, the son of Terah, Abraham, things really slow down and the, the narration zooms in on this family of Abraham. And that's what you have for the rest of Genesis. You have the family of Terah's son, Abraham, and then the two brothers, and then the two brothers. So this period in Genesis, this second, not second half of the book, because it's much more than half, but chapters 12 through 50 of Genesis are the patriarchal period. The whole of Genesis after chapter 11 is devoted to this family and their story, because that family by the beginning of Exodus is going to have grown from about 70 something members to a massive multitude of people down in Egypt. And then the story of the Exodus and the rest of the Bible. So just knowing this Toledot structure, this gives us a clue as to how the book of Genesis itself should be read, how it's structured, possibly where if you hold to some type of source theory that Genesis was sources that either Moses or later redactors used to put together, that these Toledot sections are possibly evidence of that, at least much more likely than any of the JEDP documentary theories that are all vying for acceptance among mainline Old Testament scholars. If anything, it seems like these sections are tailor-made for places where the account would have been put together. If that's something that interests you and you want to explore that further, I want to recommend Dwayne Garrett's book, Rethinking Genesis. It's all about this, how these Toledot structures possibly give us an understanding of how Genesis was put together by its author or authors, whether or not that was Moses or any later redactors. But this is what we have now. We have all of the creation week, the first creation account in Genesis chapter one. So take a look at this for a second. You should see a pattern. It should Things should start to make a little more sense the more you look at this. Let me give you some help. You see the correspondence? Let me give a little more help. This is what we have in Genesis 1. Now, our esteemed professor behind me on the shelf, Professor Iron Man, has done a video on this very pattern and the beauty and the design that we see inherent in the Genesis 1 account. So check that out if you haven't already. But you have on the left-hand side, the first three days, God is bringing into being, ordering, separating, organizing the realms, the domains. Then on days four, five, and six, God is putting into place, installing, appointing, establishing the rulers of each of those realms or the ones that will have dominion over each of those domains. So the day and the night are going to be, remember the term used on day four, governed, ruled over by the greater light and the lesser light. That's not accidental. It's not an incidental detail. God bless the fish and the birds and tells them to be fruitful and multiply and fill. Well, what do the fish and the birds rule over? What do they have dominion over? What is their realm? It's the waters and the sky. And then when God makes two creative acts of bringing about dry land and then another creative act of putting plants, vegetation on the land, what does he do on the corresponding day six? 
two creation acts. He brings about the animals that will live on the land and eat the plants and humanity that will live on the land, that will cultivate the plants, that will rule over the animals and over all of creation. So there's perfect parallelism in each of these days. And then it's undergirded all, it's capped off all by a Sabbath, a divine Shabbat, a ceasing of work. Now, no other ancient culture, to my knowledge, did this. Every other ancient culture that I'm aware of worked for seven days, because if you don't work for seven days, you don't eat for seven days. You have to work every day that you expect to eat. And so in Israel, from the very beginning, there was this idea that, no, we actually take one day and use that one day to honor, to sanctify, to to reflect on our creator. And so you get this concept that was bequeathed to the rest of humanity after Old Testament, the notion of Sabbath, of a six day work week. So if you see this pattern, this this it's sometimes called the framework pattern of Genesis, it's pretty undeniable. Interpreters have long recognized this. This is not anything I'm making up, it's not anything new. This is the literary structure of the text. So once you recognize this, then you start to ask the questions like, okay, so is Genesis trying to give us a detailed chronology of creation? Or is it Genesis trying to paint us a picture of an overall concept of God as a divine worker, creating, building his creation that will ultimately be all of creation will be a temple to God, and then instilling the image of God in that temple. Is that closer to what's going on here? And that's something that you would find, say, John Walton arguing for. Others say, well, this framework pattern is there. It's undeniable. But this pattern also happens to correspond if you take into account phenomenological language and describing things generally and figuratively rather than scientifically and precisely. This seems to fit what we know about how the earth developed to begin with, starting with the formation of the atmosphere, the volcanic activity that brought about the continents, the green life that appeared on the land, which then the atmosphere thinned out even more so you could then see visibly the sun, moon, and stars, then the higher life forms of swimming things and flying things developed, and then at the end of that long process, you had land animals, and ultimately people. So people that take a concordist approach, they may not necessarily rule out the framework theory. I mean, it's there, it's undeniable. But they also would say, but it's done in a framework pattern that also reflects what science tells us about the creation of the world. And other framework proponents would say, no, 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 this doesn't have anything to do with what science tells us. And when we start asking those questions, then we have to try to monkey around with the text to make it fit so that God making the sun, the moon, and the stars on day four, we have to translate that as God had made and then interpret it as, well, they just became visible on this day, which to framework proponents who are not concordists, it just seems contrived. It seems artificial. And then you have people that are young earth creationists. They look at all this and sort of dismiss it. And they say, just read the text. The text is plain. A day is a day. God created it. That's how it happened. And then they will try to do science through the lens of reading Genesis literally. And that's where you end up with Answers in Genesis, the, you know, the Creation Museum, the Ark Encounter, a lot of homeschool curriculum from Christian homeschool groups. Like That's the kind of approach that you get that just says, read it and take it literally. So those are three approaches that are at odds with each other in different ways. But here's the thing. As Christians, you're free to take any of those approaches. Any approach that's based on the text where somebody is trying to wrestle with and interpret scripture and then let scripture form their worldview, that's a Christian approach. The disagreement's gonna come because we are gonna give different weight to different arguments. We're gonna put different emphasis on different passages. Our hermeneutics will determine our exegesis and that will then determine how we apply the text particularly when it comes to issues of the Bible and science. We've mentioned it before in each of these videos, and I never know who's watching what video because this is YouTube, and so some people catch one video, some people watch the whole series, but we have an entire course here at Disciple Dojo on the website called The Bible and Science, Friends or Foes. 
It's a five part video series. There's a free downloadable workbook. We walk through the different ways Christians have interpreted scientific data, how Christians have approached the concept of science to begin with, how science had its origin in the Judeo-Christian Islamic worldview, as opposed to various pagan worldviews or Eastern worldviews. And then we do what we've done in this video series. We take a walk through the creation days of Genesis 1 and look at it in its ancient Near East literary context. So that interests you. That video resource is entirely free, and all of the resources here at Disciple Dojo are entirely free because we are a nonprofit ministry, and that was the first decision that I made when we got our nonprofit status was our teaching and video and audio podcast. All of those resources will always be free. No paid membership, no levels of support that you give to get access to other stuff, none, none of that. If it's digital teaching material, it's going to always be free through the ministry of Disciple Dojo. And the only way, honestly, that we can do that and have this channel and make videos like this and keep them coming on a regular basis, as well as our other outreach ministries that Disciple Dojo does, the only way is through our monthly dojo donors. So if you appreciate this ministry, if you enjoy this video series, if you want to help us grow this teaching ministry, then do two things for me. Like and subscribe to this channel let other people know about it and help us get the word out about Disciple Dojo's YouTube channel. And if you're able, consider becoming a monthly dojo donor. You can give at any amount, a couple of bucks a month, a couple of hundred bucks a month. Just know that everything we do is donor funded. And along with praying for this ministry, that is a tangible way that you can support Disciple Dojo. But the question that it all comes back to as we look at the Genesis creation week how do we hold this in balance with what we see in science? Like, how do I square what I see in Genesis 1 with what I read in National Geographic? And I'll give you the answer that my dad, who is a pastor, gave me when I was probably in middle school and started asking these questions. We had these old encyclopedia, I think it was World Book, like from the 60s. And this is a picture of it that I took. And if you open it to human, H, volume, it would have this anatomy chart. And these are plastic sheets, so you could peel each page back, and like this is the um, organs. If you peeled this away, it would show the skeletal structure. If you flipped over the other one on top of this, I think it would be the muscles, and then on top of that would be the skin. So my dad said, imagine taking this and holding up a painting right beside it, like the Mona Lisa, and just holding these in front of you and saying, which of these depicts a human? what would the answer be? The answer obviously would be, well, both of these depict a human. Now imagine if somebody were to go, wait a minute, I don't see any muscular or organ or bone labels or features on this. How can it be depicting a human? Or if somebody said, I don't see any skin tone shading. I don't see any emotion. I don't see any beauty. There's no background. This is just in a white void. How can this be a person? Now, the answer is clear. You'd recognize, well, because they have two different purposes. Mona Lisa is not trying to give a detailed breakdown of anatomy, even though Leonardo probably could have done a pretty good job at that. And the encyclopedia entry is not trying to depict any particular aesthetic beauty. They have two different purposes. Now, is there general agreement? Like they both have a head area, okay? They both have these limbs, only these are folded and overlapping. In this one, you can just see one of them. So there's differences, but there's also general similarities. They semi-concord with one another, but they don't in the details. And so I wanna suggest that that is the model that we should use as we're approaching Genesis and science. Genesis, the book of scripture, and science, the book of nature, that they have the same author. And if we're reading both books correctly, they will be saying complementary things. If we see contradiction between them, there's a good chance that we're reading one or both of them incorrectly. Does that clear up all of the mysteries and all of the quandaries and all of the questions that we have about Genesis and science? No, of course not. There's 
endless amount of scientific investigation, of biblical interpretive theological investigation. I mean, they're ongoing disciplines that should be mutually informing each other when they start to speak to one another's domain. But what this series is trying to do is get readers of scripture to note the different ways that Genesis 1 can and has been interpreted and to be able to thoughtfully, rationally, prayerfully, faithfully form our biblical, anthropological, cosmological theology. Because at the end of the day, there are some major differences between Genesis 1 and what we read in other ancient creation accounts that should inform how we then try to compare Genesis to modern cosmological accounts. So some of the key differences, and these are worth noting, in the Genesis account, there is no divine struggle. Remember, God, Yahweh did not have to slay any chaos serpent in order to bring about creation. He did not have to usurp or bump out of the way other gods in order to claim the divine perch. There's no cosmogony. Cosmogony is, is the, the, how the God comes about, how the God is born. And other ancient Near East accounts are filled with cosmogonies, various gods, how they were brought into being. But there's none of that in Genesis. God is, in the Genesis account, the eternal first cause. There is no time before or apart from him. So asking, well, who created God or who made God is like asking, JM, what's your wife's name? Well, I, I can't answer that question. I don't have a wife. So therefore, by definition, my wife doesn't have a name, even though all wives have names, right? I don't have a wife. She doesn't have a name. Well, God doesn't have a creator. So therefore, the question who created God by definition is an illegitimate, philosophically illegitimate question if God is that first cause, the unmoved mover, the uncreated creator. At some point, everything has to get back to an initial brute fact. And in the Genesis account and the rest of scripture, that initial brute fact is not a fact, it's a person, and it's the person of Yahweh, God. There are no rival forces in the creation account. God doesn't have to battle anyone or anything. Creation comes from nothing. This is hinted at or at least allowed in Genesis 1, although Genesis 1 is not explicitly teaching creation ex nihilo, creation from nothing. The rest of scripture that, that comments on and fleshes out Genesis 1 is explicit about doing so. That God brought into being everything, not from pre-existing primordial stuff, but rather through his divine word. And that's the next thing that separates Genesis from many, if not most, other ancient creation accounts is God speaks and things happen. God speaks and the land brings forth. God speaks and there was. In the ancient creation accounts of Israel's neighbors, humans are an afterthought. In the Mesopotamian accounts, humans are created because the gods want or need little beings to serve them to feed them, to take care of their needs so that they can lounge about in their heavenly domains while humans labor and strain and groan and worship them down on the earth. You don't see that in Genesis. Humans are not an afterthought. Humans are Adam, the crown of creation. It was all leading up to Adam. And then once God created humanity in his image, then God steps back and ceases and says, it's done. Now we rest. And so this speaks to people the way no ancient Near East background myth could. It tells every member of society, whether they're a slave, whether they're a servant, whether they're born with a birth defect, whether they're an outcast from their society, whether they live in poverty, whether they live in luxury, whatever their circumstances, there's this democratization of worth. And that each human being is the image of God. And together, collectively, all human beings, Adam, male and female, are the image of God. That's revolutionary in the ancient world. The entire notion of human rights comes from that concept. And it's because, unlike other ancient Near East cosmologies and unlike secular modern cosmologies, humans are not an accident. Humans are not just the tail end of a mindless process that never had them in mind and doesn't care when we come and go from the scene. According to the Genesis account, what makes biblical faith different from any other cosmology is 
humans are the image of God, male and female. You will never look into the eyes of someone who is not the image bearer of God. You'll never look into the eyes of someone who does not reflect, imprint, have a stamp on them of their creator. No matter how bad they are, no matter how weird they are, no matter how annoying they are, no matter what race they are, what language they speak, what country they're from, whether they're documented or undocumented, their political party affiliation, none of that. All of us are God's image. And our calling is to live that out in our life. So I hope this guided tour of creation has been helpful. Um, It's fun to sit down and just really go through very slowly and methodically, verse by verse, sometimes word by word, passages of scripture. So look for more of that in the future here at Disciple Dojo. I would love to hear what questions you have or what thoughts you have or what things you would like to see addressed that have to do with Genesis 1. What did I miss? What did we leave out in this section? There's no way that we covered everything. You could spend whole semesters just on Genesis chapter one. So let me know in the comments below what you would have liked to see us cover. We can't cover everything, but I do read your comments and the ones that are thoughtful, the ones that aren't troll comments, the ones that aren't combative, uh, I kind of just brush those aside for the most part. But the ones that really show a desire to engage, even to challenge at times, we never mind that here at Disciple Dojo. That's what you do in a dojo. You challenge each other. You spar with each other. So that is always welcome as long as, like in an actual martial arts dojo, it's done with respect, not antagonism. So let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Hope this video series has been helpful. Thank you for those of you that have subscribed. Those of you that haven't already, click the subscribe button. We're getting close to 10,000 and our goal for 2023 is to reach 20,000 by the end of the year. Lofty goal. I don't know if we're going to do it, but we are going to try and your help is most appreciated. That's all for this series. Thank you for watching and as always keep training.